Hello and welcome to a special episode of the Modern Maker Workroom. Now, previously I had talked a little bit about some changes that I was making to my content. And one of those things is that I want to start exploring other time periods and other types of clothing. I have up to now mostly focused on 16th and 17th century clothes. And as much fun as that is, after 25 years of doing it, I have sort of looked outside my bubble and kind of found that there's a lot of information lacking on constructing menswear from other time periods. And the first place I'm going to start is the Regency era. Now the Regency era encompasses quite a, a long time span, beginning at the end of the 18th century and going to almost the middle of the 19th century. I want to explore just making a Regency man's outfit. And the place to start with that, of course, is with the undergarments. So. I made a linen shirt. I have made 17th century shirts before and I find them to be very fun to do, but uh, this late 18th, early 19th century style is a completely different animal. I found it to be much more labor intensive. I found the stitching, especially all of the top stitching to be quite tedious. And you know, my top stitching is not as precise as it could be. When you look at some of these surviving garments, the highest quality versions of them, these, like lines of top stitching are incredibly small and incredibly perfect. And in slightly coarser, less, um, what appears to be less wealthy class garments, it's a little bit less precise. So mine <laughs> is a little bit lower than the kind of quality you would see in a very wealthy gentleman's outfit. However, it's still a shirt, it's still comfortable, it works with the clothing of the time period. So I hope you'll come with me on this journey as I begin to explore other things. Let's get to it, there's lots of stitching to see, even though it's all white and it's all gonna blow out the camera and it's all gonna be tedious, tedious, tedious. Um, the shirt's cute, it feels really good, and I hope you enjoy the video. Thank you so much for joining me. I'm Matthew Nagy, now let's get stitching. Cutting, of course, is the first thing that we need to do with this process. Now we've got two diagrams here. We have one in the bar system, and then this one can just be calculated with your own measurements. Layout is pretty basic. The diagram really shows you exactly what you need to be doing, uh, but you know, watch the video and watch me do a little bit of the layout. It goes pretty quickly. You know, first the lengths of the body are laid out because they're the largest pieces. And then once they're in place, then the sleeve length is also added in. And after that, all of the smaller pieces along the selvages are cut. Now the body is along the fold, so it is twice as wide as this line that I've just drawn here. Um, but um, you should be able to make it comfortable for whatever size you need. This is 60 inch wide cloth that you're seeing here and uh, just know that this shirt that I'm making is for me and I wear s somewhere between an extra large and a 2XL. So given that I'm a fairly large guy that means a, a lot of you should be able to cut this shirt out without too much trouble. Our first order of business is to finish the neck slash. And I like to do this first just so I have a visual reference as to what is center front and what is the back of the garment. And it also just prevents it from getting torn or stressed out during the process. So the edges are hemmed back. And then at the very bottom of the neck, we're going to do a series of buttonhole stitches because we can't roll around the bottom of this cut. So we use buttonhole stitches to secure it and keep it safe. And once the buttonhole stitches are in place, we will do a little buttonhole bar across the gap at the bottom. And this just adds a little bit of extra strength so that when the garment's being worn, put on and taken off particularly, you don't have stress at the bottom of that cut causing it to tear. The buttonhole bar will take the stress. As soon as that's done, we move on to stitching the neck gussets. Now the right angle corner of the triangle is what gets stuck into the very end of this cut. And then I'm using uh, you know, a relatively small seam allowance, probably quarter inch, three eighths of an inch seam allowance, 
to start the stitching and about halfway across the side of the gusset I will start pulling up little pinches of fabric with my sewing needle. Now when there's such a small area to be gathered I generally don't run a gathering thread. I'll just do what you're seeing right here which is to just pull up a little piece of the fabric with my needle and just stitch it in place to create a fold. Once that's done, I will have to stitch the second leg of the gusset. And then after that, then I'll finger press it and I'll put the little facing on. You'll see that in a second. So the gusset, I, then again, I, I begin right there in the middle and work my way out to the pointy end of the triangle. And everywhere that I stitch, I'm making sure that I take these stitches very small and very secure. And about halfway across the side, you see me here, I start to push in little tiny bits of fullness. And it's very easy to just take one of these and then do a stitch in between and then push up a little fullness and do another stitch in between. And that helps settle this the uh, gathers in place very comfortably and very evenly. With the gusset in place, now you see me finger pressing. And this just, I would rather do this all sitting in, in one go rather than getting up and going to the iron constantly. So I do a lot of finger pressing. It's linen, it's very easy to do such a thing. Then the gusset is taken and the sides of the gusset are folded in place. And then that ends up being uh, a lining for the gusseted area. And this covers those raw seam allowances. You don't really have to do anything to you know, roll them in place like you do other portions of the seam allowance. So before I start all the stitching, I'm going to just baste this in place because I'll tell you, using pins when you are trying to do hand sewing just means that you're gonna get it caught on all of your stitches every single time that thread's gonna catch. So baste things in place, it's very quick, it's very easy, doesn't take a lot of time, and that just makes the hand sewing go that much faster. And you'll see me here taking little felling stitches to hem in place. And I've done the first leg and now I'm doing the second leg. And uh, it's just small, tiny felling stitches and I'm really trying to not let anything come through to the outside of the garment. This is just hemming this facing in place. The shoulder straps are next. I'll just take this little rectangle and I will fold it into thirds so that it's nice and substantial and it will uh, hold a lot of stress. Once it's folded, then I will lay it in place along the shoulder and baste right down the center to hold it in place while I stitch. Once in place, then I will use a felling stitch along the outside edge. I'm not entirely sure if this is accurate. I think most surviving garments are just top stitched right in place. I don't think there's a lot of evidence for the felling stitch, but it's what I automatically did, so here you go. And then a series of back stitches are worked along the edges of the strap, uh, about an eighth of an inch in from the fold. And this is what that intersection will look like when it's complete. So now we'll move on to attaching the collar. And the collar requires a little bit of work and a little bit of finesse, um, but it's very doable. So the first thing we'll do is fold it in half and find our centers. And I just thumb crease this very quickly so that I know where they are. There's no need to cut a notch or anything. The linen will totally hold the crease. Once that's done, then the ends get folded in and finger pressed as well. And I'm using about a 3 8 inch seam allowance here. That's nine millimeters for those of you using the metric system. And then once the short ends are folded, then I'll do the long end as well. Before I can attach the collar, I need to run a gathering stitch along the neckline. So I'll begin just a little bit away from center front and I'll begin my gathering and I'll run this from the center front to center back and then I'll use that same thread, pull up the gathering and then I'll back stitch my way towards center front again. So I'm only doing half the collar. And as soon as I get these pinned in place, I can start my stitching. You'll see me fussing a little bit, trying to get everything lined up. And I think it's just because I really can't baste once my gathering is pulled up. So I wanna make sure that 
everything is properly aligned and that my gathering is pulled to the correct tension. Once it's there, then I can begin my back stitching. And again, just as I did with the gusset, I'm going to use my needle to sort of drag a little bit of fullness over. You see me do it just there. I'll drag a little bit of fullness over and I'll take a stitch around a fold and then I will take a stitch between that fold and the next one. And then I'll drag another piece of fullness over and take the stitch. I proceed to do this the rest of the way towards center front. And then when I run out of gathers, then I just work flat. And then I'll put a fresh thread in and I'll gather the second half from center back to center front and then work my way with back stitches toward the center again. When all of that stitching is done, then I can just fold the collar down and baste it in place over all of that stitching to cover the, the beautiful gathers that we just carefully stitched in place. And again, the basting is just there because it makes the hand sewing so much easier. Once that's done, then I will fell the long edge in place. And you see me, I'm actually working on the outside of the garment. I like to fold the collar toward the outside like this to cover the stitching. It just works better for me. Um, once that's hemmed in place, then I will close the ends with little tiny invisible stitches. I believe some of the extant garments were done with whip stitches, um, but whatever stitch you use, just make it small, make it firm, and make it regular. Once the collar is all done, you can remove the basting and we can move on to the next step. And the next step is lots of teeny tiny back stitching. And this is done about 1 8 of an inch to 3 16 of an inch away from the neckline edge. And this is something on historical garments that is done incredibly small and incredibly precise. My top stitching just looks so sloppy compared to the actual historical garments. So keep that in mind as you're working. Before we move on, while we have the collar in our hands, let's just go ahead and make this buttonhole. Now it begins with a small diagonal base just surrounding the area where the buttonhole is going to go. And it doesn't have to be terribly complicated and as soon as it's done, we can uh, then work a line of back stitches across each side. And that's specifically because the linen will shred very easily. So we want to secure it very well, and I don't want to use any wax on it. Once the back stitches are done along the long sides of the buttonhole, then I'll take my little chisel and I'll just give it a quick tap. And now my hole is open and ready to stitch. As soon as it's open, I'm going to work the stitches around it. And I'll begin by stranding the hole. And I have a double thread of linen in my needle and I'm just gonna slip my needle under some of these back stitches along the sides of the buttonhole to give extra strength, to, can keep, uh, to keep the hole from stretching out of place and control it. And it just gives a little bit of extra padding to the shape of the buttonhole and it makes it look really nice, especially when you're doing it on such a thin fabric. The extra reinforcement is useful. Once the stranding is complete, then I will begin to work my buttonhole stitches on top. Now these are Taylor's buttonhole stitches, so there's an extra wrap at the top, and it completely depends on which direction. It is not a blanket stitch. You want to wrap the opposite direction from a blanket stitch so that you have this little extra knot that sits in the mouth of the buttonhole and takes all of the stress of wear. I'm using a double strand here because I want to keep the same linen for everything. Um, you don't necessarily have to, but it's what worked for me. This is a fantastic little technique, and this was definitely done in the time period. So I'm using a quadruple strand of the same linen that I'm sewing with, and I'm wrapping it minimum 20 times around this knitting needle. Then you pull it off and you have to hold super tight. Don't let any of those strands unwind because let me tell you, it's a mess. As soon as you have it in your hands, you start buttonhole stitching around it. Now this is a regular buttonhole stitch, also known as a blanket stitch. You don't have to have the extra pearl bump on the outside of this. Make sure as you're doing these stitches that you pull very tight. 
the idea is that you should compress all of the wound threads of the core very tightly and they harden together into something very, very firm as you run these stitches around the outside edge. Doing so creates a hard button that will fasten well and will last a long time and it will survive washing, which is the most important aspect of it. To create the shank, we will take some strands of thread across the back of the button and then cover them with buttonholes, very much the same technique that we use to just create a simple bar tack. When that button is complete, I'm gonna have a little moment here to show you what it looks like. And then I like to take this over to my iron and I kind of crush it with steam and heat. And this further compresses the linen and makes the button hard and useful. It feels like a normal button when you've done this. And then to sew it on, you just sew it on like any other shank style button. And I tend not to, to put them on in a manner where I scoop the needle underneath. I really wanna make sure that I stab through so that I keep the button really secure. Sleeves are next. And just as we started with the gussets on the neck, we're gonna start with the gussets on the sleeve. I'll begin by basting the little square in place. Now this is going in the armpit. I believe the gussets for period garments were a little bit bigger than this. Um, this is sort of my default size when I'm cutting a linen shirt like this. And it was, I have to say, very comfortable to wear. The seam is backstitched. And I'm taking about a half inch wide seam allowance because right here you see I'm rolling the seam allowance back on itself. And then I will hem that seam allowance onto the gusset. This closes in all of the raw edges. It makes it very strong. And I only will sew the gusset on one side. A lot of people complete the sleeve and that's not how I like to work. I like to do as much flat as possible. So I'll take the sleeve, I mark the center, and then I match the center up on the body. And I will do a lot of my stitching and gathering here before the underarm of the sleeve is sewn. And that helps really keep my work efficient and keeps it from being um, too tedious. As soon as I have everything pinned in place, and I do use a couple of pins here, then I'll draw up my gathers and I will treat this exactly the same way I did stitching the collar. I will begin at the center and then I'll catch my gathers with my back stitches as I go, evenly distributing them along the cap of the sleeve. Now I like to concentrate my gathers a little bit more in the center because I feel like it makes the sleeve drape really well. And as soon as that's done, I move on to the other side and complete it the same way. Shirts of this style have an armhole facing, which is just a long flat rectangle that covers the gathered seam and stitches onto the body, and it becomes a shoulder reinforcement as well. So first it is basted in place, and then I use running stitches uh, for the flat sections, and when I reach the gathered area, then I'll change to back stitches to stitch the rest of the, the area. Because it's just a facing, it's not gonna take a lot of stress, so I don't use a back stitch anywhere except the gathers where it might take a little bit more stress. As soon as it's in, I'll give it a good finger press and then I will prep it for hemming. Again, everything is finger pressing here. There's very little, very few trips to the iron. So as soon as I'm done with that, then I'll turn it around and I'll finger press the long edge and then turn the short ends in and then flip this facing onto the body and baste it in place so that I can hem it down. Now these stitches to hem it down need to be very, very small. They need to be as innocuous as possible because they do show on the outside, but if you make them small and firm, your stitches should look beautiful on the outside, even and regular work your way around the armhole facing. I call it the armhole stay because that's what it's for as well. And then as soon as it's done, remove your basting and move on. The next step then is to complete the adjacent side of the gusset. Now I do this in several steps. I don't stitch and roll. I just stitch all of the seams for the remaining part of the gusset and then I will stitch the underarm seam of the sleeve and following that I'll stitch the side seam of the body. In so doing I prepare all of these seams and I have more control over which direction that they roll. So 
now it gets a little tedious because I have to crunch the work up into my hand to hem all of these down. As soon as all of that is complete, I do a line of top stitching next to the shoulder seam and this gives a nice firm edge and the end result looks like this. Of course I have to repeat all of that on the other side of the garment. So here's a little time lapse video to show that process happening. Finishing the sleeves uh, is pretty much the same as we have done for the rest of the garment. Much of the work is, is very similar. So we will hem the, hem the sleeve opening and then we'll prep the sleeve end by running our gathering stitches along it. Once the gathering stitches are in place, then the cuffs are prepared in the same way that the collar was. In this instance, however, we'll press up the long end first and the sides second and that has everything to do with the fact that once we stitch it on we'll use that folded end of the side to uh, enclose the seam allowance and it becomes a very tidy uh, end when you do it this way. So I'm gathering everything in place, I'm getting the cuff where it needs to be and now I'm going to work my back stitches across the entire cuff exactly the same way as I did with the collar and the shoulder in that I'll back stitch from left to right, which is essentially a stem stitch for those of you who embroider. And as I work, I will capture one little fold in every single stitch, and that gives me this beautiful, evenly spaced gathering. Now, in the case of the sleeve, there's more fullness here than other parts of the garment, so um, you should just catch a fold in every stitch without doing one in between. So here you can see that end seam allowance wrapping around the main seam allowance for the shirt sleeve and it just closes in. It wraps around the seam allowance sticking up off of the sleeve and gives a very clean finish. Once those are pinned in place then I hem the ends and hem the bottom as well. This is felled in place with very very tiny neat organized felling stitches. I um, didn't record this section because I've already shown you how to make a buttonhole and a button and I put those in the end of the sleeve and now we're just moving on to finishing the hem. Those are hemmed up and then the bottom is also turned up and hemmed. I usually use a slightly wider seam allowance for the, the bottom hem of the shirt. Now these little bits, we call them butterflies in modern shirt making, but they are little tiny reinforcement gussets that go at the top of the side slit of the shirt. And this helps keep the shirt uh, safe and secure from tension and too much wear in that area. You don't have to run the risk of your side seam splitting with your delicate hand stitching when you have this little gusset in place. It really reinforces. And the way I do it is I take a nice big square and then I fold all the corners of the square into the center and then I fold that little triangle in half and I just insert it into the gusset. So here you see me starting by working at the top With the gusset held in place, then I will just work my stitching the way it needs to go. Slowly working up one side and then down the other. Once the outside is sewn, then I will turn the shirt over and I'll just fold the little triangle up into location and I will close it with more felling stitches on this side. And then the shirt is complete.
So here it is. It feels really good, I have to say. You know, I'm so used to wearing 17th century shirts that feeling an 18th, you know, an 18th century style, which this really is, you know, it originated in the 18th century. It just, it feels different. Now, I'm with the magic of camera work, I am going to uh, tuck this into my pants. Okay, it is tucked in. Now, these are not super authentic pants. They have a fall front on them, but these were part of, they must have been part of a stage production. I picked them up at a secondhand store. I thought that they were perfect for this because I haven't made the breeches yet. That's a couple of steps down the line. Uh, so they work well. The shirt feels even better when it's tucked in. Um, you know, it's it's got the right amount of fullness. It's not binding really anywhere. Like I can put my arms over my head. I can move very freely. And now I'm going to put on my neck cloth and then a waistcoat on top of it. And we'll see what it all looks like. Neck cloth is on. Uh, I'm still getting used to tying these, you know, Regency neck cloths and their knots um, were definitely a, a cultural phenomenon. And there's very specific kinds of knots and ties with how many wrinkles in certain places. And I'm just not that familiar with it yet, but I'm getting there. Um, so now that I have this on, I'm going to put on my waistcoat and then we'll see how it all comes together. And here we are. Now, this waistcoat is a mock-up of a new pattern, so there are some things that are definitely wrong with it, but I just wanted to see how the shirt felt with the neck rig and the waistcoat and the breeches, and I, or the trousers, and I've gotta say, it all feels like it belongs together. I really like the tightness of the waistband on the trousers because it I feel like it holds my stomach in a little bit, which, for a bigger guy like me, I think that's really important. Secondly, I really like how far up the the neck cloth comes to cover, to basically to cover my second chin. I'm very uncomfortable with how heavy I am right now because you know in lockdown I've been basically eating my feelings when it comes to uh, the pandemic. So uh, having something that sort of covers up the evidence of me feeling overweight is actually really quite freeing. I feel like I look really good. I feel really good. Anyway, thanks for watching. Um, please send me questions if you have them about making the shirt, and I hope that you are enjoying your journey into Regency clothing. Thank you so much. I'm Matthew Nagy, and this was the Modern Maker Workroom.